Hello and welcome to the Jack Castillo Swansea City podcast. I'm Matt Brock and I'm joined as ever by Steve Carroll. Evening, Steve. Even. We've got a special guest on the pod this evening. A warm welcome to Ian Mitchellmore. Evening, Ian. Evening, Matt. Evening, Steve. How are you doing both? Very good, mate. Very yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for joining us on the pod. This is a special one. And um, Mitch, thanks for um, agreeing to come on. We're going to talk about the Swans, but of course, be remiss now when we the break not to touch on Wales. So we'll come on to that a little bit later on. But first and foremost, um, the game on the weekend for the Swans, Huddersfield. Um, Steve, come to you first. Uh, on paper, it was a game that we could have gone there and won and imposed ourselves and really laid down a marker of where we are and where we hope to be when the season ends against bottom of the table, Huddersfield, but it, it never really transpired like that, did it? No, it didn't. I mean, we, we did have some chances. I mean, I I got into a bit of a spat on uh, on Twitter about it, really, but I think that the issue I really had with it was, considering how much of the ball we had, we didn't really hurt them as much as we, we should have done. It didn't really feel like we created a a clear-cut chance. I mean, their goalkeepers made a couple of decent saves. The one from Oberfemi, a standout one. But, I mean, I wouldn't really say that was a great chance. It was more that Oberfemi himself did really well with, you know, a limited opportunity, really, and the keeper has done well with it. But I think that's what, like, frustrated me. I mean, if you look at the XG, Huddersfields were somehow higher than us, even though they did next to nothing in the game. So, I think that's what frustrates me. Dominated so much of the ball, but then haven't asked them enough questions, really, from my point of view. Yeah, Mitch, um, I'm coming on to that point Steve mentioned there. It's, it's been Swans' it's Achilles heel since, probably since Russell Martin's come to the club, really, that they can dominate possession, 65% plus, um, have all of the ball in and around the opposition's half. But you see moments where the opposition, like we can thank Stephen Bender once again for getting us out of jail with that smart save, um, which looked, well, a few smart saves, actually, which got us out of jail. Um, and this is where we kind of surrender opportunities to opposition teams, which they don't actually have to create themselves. Yeah, it would have been a travesty had Danny Ward scored at the end there. And credit to Nathan Wood, a good block from him as well. And it was just a typical... That one spell they had, I mean, it was their first shot on target in the 90th minute. That's how much the Swans dominated. And let's put it right, they didn't create much golden chances, but they completely bossed that game. It was it was like a, an attack redefence training game. But it's just that final third, you know, so many people have spoken about it. The wing backs, it's, it's a bit of an issue, really, certainly on the right hand side. They're desperately lacking a, an Ethan Laird or a Cyrus Christie or, or even a Hannes Wolf who played on the left, obviously. Um, but even then, you know, even if they had that, those players who have they got to put the ball in, into the box to, you know, there's not a, a towering strike who's going to be winning headers. It's just not the way they do it. So, um, you know, this is where you're noticing lacking a top in form Jamie Patterson, which they did have in the start of last season. And, you know, look at in this season, zero goals, zero assists. Granted, he's been injured and stuff as well. But, um, yeah, it's just that spark in the final third. And I think Matt Grimes has stepped up a lot this season. Hence his number of championship assists and obviously got his first goal in what a year and a half, whatever it was in that in that Birmingham game. But yeah, when you haven't got your top scorers, Joel Pirro and Michael Obafemi from last season, they're not firing as well as they did last year. Suddenly the pressure's on others and by and large, to their credit, Harry Darling, you know, these boys, Ryan Manning, they've chipped in with goals. But you need the big guns firing, and that's probably the, the key thing that's not been there this season. Um which shows you how well they've done as a squad in terms of balance. But if they can just turn that tide in the final third, they're, they're going to be a really, really good team in this division, I think. It's remarkable when Mitch goes through the players that haven't had, the, the, well, there were three big ones there, Oba, Piro and Patterson, Steve, um, who, who haven't had seasons at all really so far, and we're halfway in, um, that, that we are outside the playoffs only on goal difference and you, you think looking at it that that is a remarkable feat for everyone to chip in and as, as Mitch said Matt Grimes in particular someone who's probably been had held against him in the past and he doesn't get enough on the goals and assists chart when when the positions he gets into and he's been chipping in with um, with assists and even a goal last week as well so he's getting in that area now um, it's a weird thing for Russell Martin to deal with though isn't it because you see the emergence of Ollie Cooper in there and you see how much he brings to it. And of course, Luke Cundell's come into the team as well and he's big in bags of energy. But there's something not quite clicking in that final third, is there? You're having to see these other players chip in and you're not seeing as many balls played into Perot in those chances where last season he was just getting a sniff 
of goal and bang it was away he's not even getting those chances this season is he and Ober as well struggling in certain times to get to be able to stretch the defence and get that um, opportunity for himself. So, as, as as Mitch said, maybe maybe Pato is that link that he had last season that not now, but it is an odd one, isn't it? Yeah, it is a bit of an odd one. I mean, like you said, there are, we haven't created some of those chances in that many games. I mean, what stands out is Peru, obviously, against Sheffield United and Hull, the, the two home games just before the international break. There were big chances for him in those games, and apart from one at the end of the Hull game, he didn't take them, did he? So, you know, but we didn't see those type of chances on the weekend, did we? For example, where you look at him thinking that that really should have been a goal, for example. So, but it's I think it is frustrating. I mean, it's a great point really, that Mitch made. I mean, we're lucky the goals have been spread out a bit. We've got on Chams on five, isn't he? Cooper's chipped in with a couple, and you know, obviously Harry Darling has got three, and he hasn't played a great deal of games, and obviously you're not expecting the centre half to to score that many. Fulton's got one or two, I think. Grimes, obviously, as you say, has scored. But it, it, it is the front two, really. That are, if you'd said that they wouldn't be in double figures by this stage of the season between them, we'd have all been quite shocked, really, I think, wouldn't we? So, you know, that's definitely something that we need to, to work on. And as you say, Patterson, really, has not done a great deal since last January, I think. I know when he came back into the team, he did set up the winner for Oberfermi, but... There haven't been too many great moments from him yet, and we think if uh, we could really get him firing, that would make um, a big difference. So, um, yeah, that's that's something we need, ideally, in the second half of the season, isn't it? Well, really, you're thinking that team is probably shy of a right wing back, of on paper at least, of competing in, in, in the top six. Because you can see, as you say, we've got Ober and Perot as options, Pato, the emergence of Cooper, as we've talked about. Um, there's plenty going forward, and of course you've got Grimes and and the uh, Fulton this season. You know who thought the Fulton would have a, a future at Swansea after his omission last year? So you, you look at that and think there's all the pieces a, a, a slotting in. If we can just cut out those defensive mistakes which have just crept back in, after we went on that incredible run, we we it looked. And I've spoken to you about this before, Steve. Um, how we were just dealing things a little bit more professionally and not trying to overplay in positions of low reward, you know, trying trying to work yourself out of these holes which you're not going to gain much of, but you could concede. Um they just started to creep back in again, which has probably coincided with the results just tailing off a bit. Um but there's all the ingredients there, Mitch, if Russell Martin can just get them to click, that we could go on another run because the players are there, aren't they? Yeah, I don't doubt that one bit. I think January is going to be a big month. Um, how much backing they get, you never know. But it's probably not going to be much, as we all know. But, uh, you know, Joe Allen's going to come back. He'll be fit in December. Um, you know, if they can get that right side sorted. I've got no doubt that Joel Pirro, Michael Obafemi, Jamie Patterson will improve. You know, whether they hit the heights of last season, I don't know. But they will improve. I've got no doubt about that. Once they all start clicking, you know, you suddenly chuck in the squad options like your, your Ollie Coopers, your Cundles, um, Ollie and Cham. I think he's been in great form at times this season. Um, and it's a very, very good squad in what is actually one of the weakest championships I've seen in a long time. Or maybe not weakest, but certainly the most open. Um, you know, even after a run of five games without a win, you know, after Saturday looking at the league table and Swans are level with sixth place, was it Millwall? I think a sixth. It's just staggering. Um, um, there's definitely progress on last year. That's the encouraging part. And like you say, even even in those games where they did go on that run of six wins in in seven or whatever it was, and that they were they were making mistakes in those games. You look at the West Brom game, Carl Norton's mistake. West Brom go two one up, and you think, oh, here we go. And then Watford away, he made, he did the same. They got away with that one. It's just a theme of the way they play, I think. Um, chopping and changing the defence may not help. I know certain pundits have, have questioned that as well, but. It's just a theme of the, the game, and sometimes they've got through it, and sometimes they haven't. So, um, but they are just—I think they are very close to being one of the best teams in this division. Maybe not an automatic contender, but you know the fact that they've been so inconsistent at times—you know, a slow start, a very good spell, and then another slow spell in, in terms of results—and yet they're still right in the mix. Get it right in January, get everyone fit, and they've got a great chance to attack that second half of the season. I think. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to follow up with another question. Because you just mentioned how tight the championship is. We're actually seven points as we stand off automatic and eight points off the bottom three. It just goes to show how tight that division is, how everyone has beaten each other. So they, that's why they they call it one of the best divisions in the world, isn't it, the championship? Because it is so unpredictable. And you have so many 
um, teams just beating each other week in week out. You just do not know what's going to happen until the final third of the season when it it just starts to settle. But um, we're going to move on now from that and kind of segue my way into Russell Martin being nominated for Manager of the Month for October. Um, for well, we won five games out of seven, Steve. So it's a return, and we're in the the, the top of our form then in terms of results and we just thought maybe here we were making a real surge early on here to 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 wake pundits up and say well th- this is a team to be feared this season um perhaps since then the results have stopped a bit but what a month it was and it was a month before it kicked off that we looked at and thought well this could make or break our season because we had some massive games in there yeah we did i mean to be fair to get five wins in that month um, and obviously one draw and there was, there was a loss at Burnley wasn't there but um, I mean you're looking at that 16 points out of 21 you know it, you can't argue with that at all can you I think wherever you are in this division you'd be delighted with that and if, as you say if you look at the fixtures that we had it did look like quite a challenging month as well so yeah there were a lot of good moments you know, two late wins at West Brom and Watford nobody probably expected wins there certainly not wins in both um, obviously beating Cardiff Um the Reading game where we committed suicide really at the back, two shockers, but we did completely dominate the game and turn it around. So, yeah, it was it was an encouraging month really. But, uh, it's just a little bit of a shame we haven't won since, isn't it? It is. Um, what what? I mean, you, you you're closer to the club than than either of us, Mitch. What's the current feel within the club of where they think they're at? It's kind of going into kind of as we're looking at 21 games played now for the Swans this season edging towards that halfway point. Is there a belief in there that, that they can really push for the top six or push for even higher? And, and are they thinking it's clicking or is there is there work to be done in January behind behind closed doors? I think it's a bit of both. I think a bit of work in January can can supplement what is already a decent chance because you know you look at look at that run in October and I'll be brutally honest here, I didn't expect them to get nine points from nine from that first week back after yeah. the international break. You know, West Brom away, yes, they had a poor start, but it's a good squad away from home is always going to be tough. Watford, I think Slavin Bilic had just gone in there, was it the game before or mm-hmm. two games before, whenever it was, and then Sunderland, they'd had a decent start and, you know, nine points in that week was astonishing and, you know, I think the biggest encouragement I would say is I don't remember a team dominating Swansea this season or walking away from a game saying they completely deserved that. Even the Burnley one, the Swans started well and it was a mistake that let them 1-0 down and then they responded well. Another mistake made it 2-0 and they, they dominated 15 minutes in the second half, couldn't score. Another mistake and it's you know it's 4-0, they were just getting punished by a good side who have got players who will punish you if you do make those mistakes. So even the Blackburn one at the start of the season, the pattern of the game, it was probably how the coaches would have wanted it. And again, some howlers in that game, that was as bad as it got really in that opening month. So, you know, it's encouraging to think that you're pretty much halfway through a season now and you're yet to think, wow, they are miles better than the Swans. I don't think there's been anybody who's outplayed them completely. You know, yes, Burnley in moments and and a couple of others here and there. But on the whole, I don't remember even Preston losing that one. I mean, Swans dominate the second half there and had, you know, Freddie, Freddie Woodman makes two brilliant saves from Jay Fulton and Ryan Manning. So, I think that's got to be the encouragement. If if those key players that we mentioned at the start of the pod click and maybe one or two more in January, and all of a sudden it's a very, very competitive squad. There's, there's so many elements and so many parts to this squad. And we've seen, Steve, we've probably used it as a criticism previously um, that Russell Martin isn't really settled on his back six, if you include the goalkeeper as well. And that probably isn't helping the likes of Harry Darling and Nathan Wood, who may be in the squad, then out of it, and Norton comes back in, etc. But if they can get that right, um, as Mitch has said, the, the, the front five or six, they, there's just too much talent there for that not to click at some point this season. And it's, the back line is so young that if they can get that settled and calm and, and a less panicky when you're in those situations, because Russell Martin clearly wants, and he's going to persist with us, Playing out, playing out, playing out, and and so if that's the case, need these defenders to be confident and calm on the ball and make sure they don't make these rash mistakes. Um, there is all the elements there, isn't there? And, and and as we've spoken about before, Steve, I don't think there's actually even been a goal this season where I've thought, oh, fair play, they've they they they've got us there. We've we've almost created 
nearly every goal for the opposition through switching off or, or a mistake from us. It's it's really in our hands, isn't it, to to correct this and and we can we're the masters of our own destiny, then, aren't we? It does feel at times like we're our own worst enemies, really, with giving away of of soft goals, doesn't it? I mean, I can't remember many goals like and chams against Birmingham being scored against us, for example. It just like, seems to be individual errors or, or poor mistakes, really, as a collective. That's what's frustrating. I mean, the, the Birmingham game being the good example where, you know, the striker's completely unmarked, the goalkeeper comes out and misses it, and then the second goal, Devi's been left in a corner late on. I mean, it's a lot of it's basic stuff, and you just think we should be higher in the table because it just feels like we do gift those goals. But if we can work that out and sort it, then obviously we're going to be a lot better for it. But we have let in far too many goals. And that's the reason we're not in the top six, ultimately, because that's what's cost us the other day. Obviously, we, we couldn't find the goal at Huddersfield. But, you know, even then we could have conceded, couldn't we, at the end? So it's it's vital that we we sort that out and we, we stop conceding as many soft goals as we are. Yeah, there's a pattern. If, we, if we're scoring at one end, we're conceding. And so we see these two alls and, and whatnot. And, 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 and likewise, if we can keep a clean sheet, we almost re, really struggle to score at the other end. So there's, we've got to strike that balance somewhere, haven't we? But fingers crossed, it all comes good. I'm going to move over now from the Swans, and we'll leave that there, because I don't know if you know, gents, there's a little matter of a World Cup coming up, and uh, we're involved for the first time in our lifetimes. So um, it'd be fantastic if we could just... Focus the rest of the pod on Wales and their chances in Qatar. Um, Mitch, you first. You're going out there. You're, you're working out there, and you're going to be. Um, you're going out this week, are you? I am. I'm going. Time recording on Monday night, so I'm going on Tuesday morning, and I've got an empty suitcase looking at me waiting to be filled. So <laughs> <laughs> try and get that done tonight. But yeah, I'll be um, be there for the duration with Wales, and uh, fingers crossed, it's a long time out there. Yeah, um, the idea of Wales being in the World Cup is something that perhaps since, um, well, I guess I guess when you start going back as far as Gary Speed and stuff like that and you start thinking, well, there's something here now and there's youngsters and they're coming through and he's knitting as a team um, and we started getting results and obviously it's gone on and on and on from there and we had that amazing Euro journey, Steve. Um, this is the culmination of God knows how many years hard work with the same group of players. Yeah, it is. You know, obviously, there's, there's a few changes now, isn't there, since um, the Euros, but it does feel like a lot of the big hitters are ones that have been on the journey for for a long time, really. But, um, you know, obviously, 2016 was the big one because it was just the monkey off your back of qualifying and then there's the belief that we could we could do it. And obviously, we massively exceeded expectations, didn't we? And, um, you know, I think there was disappointment, really, then, when we didn't make the, the last World Cup. I think there was we were in a favourable group and it was a tight one in the end that could really have gone either way between three or four teams and obviously we didn't end up making it but um, made the last Euros and now obviously we've you know we, I think in this campaign I look at it and think we had a little bit of luck maybe with the draw and you think you get Austria home you get Ukraine at home the games are spaced out a bit because Ramsey and Bale would have found it tough to have played two games in four days I ever thought um, and you just think that Ukraine maybe could have had a penalty uh, in the first half of that game they were the better side I would say and just our day. I mean, I, I phoned my dad after the game and I said, look, I remember some of the other tales you told me about where Scotland have, have pinched it from us at the end. I think served mm-hmm. once or twice the Paul Bowden penalty. Um, and you just think at last, maybe we got a little bit lucky, which is probably deserved over the case of 64 years, isn't it? So, um, yeah, great. Uh, can't wait to uh, to get out there now myself. Yeah, and Rich, um, since you really, I mean, that that squad that's been together for, for many years now, um, it started, I guess, looking really positive when you went to the Gary Speed uh, era. And then Chris Coleman comes in and, and we've got this together, stronger mantra culminating in that, in that Euros run. Um, and if anything, I mean, people from all over Europe and even the world at that point were just wanted, almost had Wales as their second country because it was just an infectious atmosphere and attitude where you had uh, a superstar in Gareth Bale playing alongside a League One player in the same pitch and, and they're all equals and they're all playing there um, and, and, and giving their all and playing for the badge and playing for the country. And 
guess no matter where you're from, that's what you want, isn't it? You want players to 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 to, to bleed on the pitch for you and, and really run yourself, run themselves into the ground and, and and show how much they care. Um, but to see that and have that sprinkling of quality with Allen and Ramsey and Williams at the time, and of course Gareth Bale, it was everything just had come together and that squad has carried us through this this, this generation almost, hasn't it? Well, yeah, we'll have a, a couple of League Two ones there this time as well, so we've gone even further down the pyramid. But um, it, oh, it's, it's an unbelievable journey. You know, we've all been there as kids um, through the tough years and just no hope going into campaigns. And it was it was quite depressing. You going into Euros and World Cups. I always used to wear a Brazil top or an Italy or Portugal. I'm sure you boys had the same. And mm. it was just like it was just accepted that we just don't play in major tournaments. And then. You know, like you say, Speedo changed so many things, as did Tosh and, and Brian Flynn, who never gets enough of a mention, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, it was nice to see some of the stuff on the, the BBC doc, which was brilliant, giving him a, uh, the praise that he deserves. Um, but yeah, it was just, it all started with speed and you start sort of enjoying games and you can see there's a, a journey and a plan and it just gives you that bit of hope. And, you know, to go on from that Serbia hammering under under Cookie to, to where we are now, it's in... But it's 10 years, isn't it? Just over. It's absolutely staggering. None of us could have believed this when we were, you know, in primary and secondary school, could we? So just enjoy it. Enjoy it while we still can, boys. We were in um, a position not not so many years ago, I guess around the Euros time, Steve, when we, where we were looking at it and we were saying, this is... This is going to be it for us. I think. I think anything after this is a disappointment. We had, obviously, we had the the Swans, um, you know, in, in in the Premier League, and having the everything that was coming with that. Again, like you were saying about Wales there, Mitch, about growing up thinking we're never going to compete. Well, similarly, we're walking on the streets when we were kids. Everyone's in a Liverpool and Man United top because it almost felt like a different sport. You had the Swans down the fetch and then there was football on TV on a Saturday night that Gary Lineker presented and they just didn't feel the same. And to see us at the playing at the highest table and, and same with Wales, Steve, it was that era there and that pushing us into the into this in this super superstar light if you like um it is just unbelievable wasn't it yeah it was i mean we were truly spoiled and i always say that you know the best thing really is that to have it the way around that we've had it whereas when we were kids as i say the swans were not very good you know the, my first year of season thing i think we finished 20th in league two um one of my uh, the game that they're on about with um Wales losing 7-1 in Netherlands. I remember that. That was one of the first Wales games I remember watching. And it's gone from that to Europe League Cup, seven years in the Premier League with the Swans, two Euros, and now a World Cup with Wales. So very spoilt. I feel like the only things really that we haven't seen is an FA Cup win or final for the Swans, which feels like asking a lot. And now obviously we will take off a, a Wales World Cup. So it just remains... Uh, a win over England if we can't do that in this tournament. Yeah, well, so we had a chance in the Euros, didn't quite come off. Um, there'll be another one coming up in a couple of weeks, Mitch. Um, and once again, we're seeing Swansea City heavily represented, whether it be through players or academy uh, products that have come through and moved on to uh, bigger and better things in the meantime. Um, and there's, there's plenty there for Swans fans to to watch and keep an eye on there from from our club as well. Yeah, well, I'll probably tee you up for the next topic here. But Ollie Cooper, obviously his inclusion, that's seven Swans out of 26 in the Wales squad, which, you know, it's fantastic. You're seven academy Swans, so it's, it's staggering, really. We were lucky to have a few of the players up at the um, Hensel Castle today ahead of the, the World Cup. The players travel out on Tuesday. Um, and I asked Conor Roberts about it and, you know, what it's like to have, you know, people who were basically your mates from when you were a teenager, really. And he just, he couldn't speak highly enough of players like you know, Joe Road and Dan James, these boys that he's played alongside. And it meant the world to him. And I know how much it means to the club. And, and even on Saturday after the, the Huddersfield game, um, I was asking Russ about Ollie Cooper's inclusion and he was delighted for him. But he was quick to mention the fact that, you know, it's a really phenomenal achievement for the club to have so many academy graduates mm. on the biggest stage. And of course, Ollie and Cham's going with... Cameroon as well so that's great for him so um, it's a terrific achievement and you know like I said I'm, I'm thrilled for Ollie Cooper because I felt he deserved it he's unlucky not to be in the 26 to be honest but um, that's a debate that we could be here all day with I think <laughs> well I'm not going to let you get off the hook that easily I think I'll have to ask you your uh, personal <laughs> if not professional opinion on the the Cooper situation because I think in that in that scenario um, 
I think that was very much a swan centric view. I think people who'd seen him outside, um, like from the South Wales Derby game, um, how he shone in that and, and, and since he's come into the Swan squad, he's playing at such a high level and playing against these playing against international players at this level, of course. Um and then you see the inclusions uh you know, Johnny Williams, Chris Gunter, and whatnot. Um, and you can see both sides of this. Uh, I think it's fair to say there's the side of, of course, you've got to appreciate the players that have got you to the World Cup and have given so much and are part of this to get a stronger camp. Uh, and they've been there and Rob Page has obviously been loyal to them a lot. And then you look at the other side and go, wow, how can you ignore this emerging talent in Ollie Cooper? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I know Steve made a point about this last week when the squad was announced. I completely understand including Johnny Williams and Chris Gunter. Um, I'm not too concerned about the fact that they're in League Two. And, you know, Johnny Esther's playing well in, in a lower league. In the reality is he could probably play in the Championship or high-end League One, in my opinion. That's just an opinion. It's not based on any fact, obviously, because we don't know. But I've got no issue with that because in a 26-man squad, how many are going to play? Maybe 16, 17, 18, if you have a couple of knocks. There's eight or nine players who aren't going to play. So yeah. when you're talking about who's that 25th, 26th man, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter in the short term. It matters in the long term. And this is where I do understand you want a blood a player like a Jordan James or a Luke Harris and you know, Ollie Cooper was a prime example. But just to come back to your original point, I think you said, was it a personal view or a professional view? Like I'd say yeah. on, on both counts, I think Ollie Cooper should have been in anyway because yeah. he was in form. He's playing week in, week out. He brings immense energy, which they're going to need out there, by the way, especially with you know, midfield, I find, is one of our weaker areas, particularly if Joe Allen's not fit or not, on, not available. Because yeah. um, beyond him, the depth isn't great. You've got players like Matt Smith, who's not playing particularly well at the moment. Dylan Levitt, you know, I like a lot of qualities about him, but the jury's out. I think he's yet to sort of really try and nail down a place despite being in, you know, camps for two, three years now. Um, Joe Morrell, I do like. I think he's uh, a capable understudy to Joe Allen. But, you know, I, I just think if Ollie Cooper was to go in there and play in that slightly deeper role, which he's done for the Swans, by the way, um, you know, he'd be more than capable of doing it in tough heat as well. And on top of that, he's a goal threat. You know, he's bringing goals and assists now. So for all those reasons, he's doing more than a lot of the other people that are there. Um, and I think Russell Martin hinted at that in his press conference the other week where he, he mentioned yeah. maybe some other names that were in ahead of Ollie Cooper and maybe perhaps unfairly. So, yeah, I, I just think he was very, very unlucky not to be in the 26. Yeah, well, I mean, no, I don't think there's a counter argument to that, really. I think it's it's from, from especially when we're on a Swans podcast here, he's not only performing well, he's providing goals and assists, he's playing every week, but also at the level he's doing it at compared to others, Steve, um, rightly or wrongly. I mean, he's doing it at this level, should be included, shouldn't he? Um, it did get a bit testy in the in the media uh, interviews between um, what Rob Page said after the squad announcement and how Russell Martin reacted. It was a little bit, well, there was a lot of perhaps, I don't want to say ill feeling, but there was definitely something there, wasn't there, Steve, in those, especially in Russell Martin's one. I mean, Rob Page said something along the lines of um, he heard that Ollie Cooper had played in eight games and he went to see him on the ninth and he wasn't playing. So you can blame their manager for that, which I think is an absolute bonkers statement to make. And if he's been playing in eight games, you should have watched at least two of them. Um, especially if South Wales Derby was one of them, but that's, that's another point. And of course, Russell Martin, um, you know, he, he, he's bit back in his way then um, not saying that, you know, Rob Page hasn't even spoken to him. So, you know, it's, it's, it did get a little bit um, frosty between the two of them, didn't it? It seemed to, yeah. I mean, from, from my point of view, it's just all just very unnecessary. I mean, look, the, the Joe Allen situation, whatever has gone on behind the scenes, obviously, the, the Swans have been very coy about it from the start. Um, you could tell, obviously, then it seems like something went wrong, didn't it, obviously? Uh, they, they've not really revealed what went on, why it happened, anything like this. And it's obvious that Robert Page is not very happy with the Swans, where, look, if the Swans are in the wrong, then and fair enough. But at the same time, I don't think he should have aired that. That could have just been sorted out behind closed doors. Um, mm. that, that little dig was was unnecessary. And then, like you say, the one about Audi Cooper just adds to it as if he's annoyed with us. And I'm thinking all he had to do, though, was pick up the phone to Russell Martin and say, look, is he going to play this weekend? I'm thinking of coming down to watch. If not, 
I won't come to this game. I'll, I'll come to another game where you think he is going to play. So, you know, there was, there was just no need for that, was there? I think. And um, Martin was quite dignified about it, really. Um, but then obviously did say he was surprised that he hadn't had a phone call about Oli. So, yeah, I think that was a way of, of him describing that he, he wasn't best pleased, but tried to remain coy in it. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear what Mitch has, uh, has got to say about it, to be honest. Well, he's passed it over to you, Mitch. <laughs> no, it's a fair point because, like I said, I was in both presses. Ironically, the, the quote that Rob Page, the one from him about Ollie Cooper, wasn't in our section. So I didn't hear that initially until when I got home or the day after, whenever it was. Mm. And there was a bit of a furore about it. And you know, obviously, I'd, I'd heard nothing. So I was a little bit surprised by that. And then I can understand why he was frustrated with that sort of the Joe situation, because like you say, it was mistakes. Russell Martin's admitted it himself from Swansea City as a club. They've done things that they shouldn't have done, really, I suppose, um, in terms of handling Joe Allen's injury. Um, you know, They'll learn from that, and that can't happen again, because it just, it just can't, simple as that, and I think they know that. Um, but with the Ollie Cooper stuff, I can understand, again, from Russ's side, why he'd be a little bit annoyed where, you know, if... He genuinely wanted to watch Ollie Cooper, like you say, just give him a call. It's easily done. Most managers do that. And, you know, according to Russ, he didn't get that phone call. So how's he to know that Rob Page wanted to be there? So I could see both sides and a little bit of frustration. But I, th- I think Steve nailed it at the start. It was all just a bit needless, wasn't it? I, you know, yeah, we, we just don't need this. That's that's the simple way of putting it, really. Yeah, absolutely. And after the speculation and whatnot of of who is going to be included and who not. I think afterwards for that to come out as well, it just it all got a bit silly, didn't it? But we move on and I'm sure both parties have moved on, or all parties moved on, because all focus now, of course, is on the opening game. Um the group of course with Wales is USA, Iran and England. USA to start off, Steve, I'm I'm this you're going to go into a tournament and everyone will do it and every team in the tournament will do it and target that first game because sometimes you can be one of the favourites but if you get off to a slow start you're immediately playing catch up and let's make no mistake about it we're also going to be looking at the USA game and looking to make a quick start Yeah, I think sometimes it can depend on how the fixtures follow as well and I think it does so happen that between us and USA is probably the most likely team that will finish second so that makes it a huge game. I mean, if we had England first, now I think there'd be a little bit of pressure off because the pressure would be on England to win. And then we would be a bit like, well, we'll be, we're not expecting much in this game. It'd be the other two games that we'd be targeting. So the fact that it's the the, the second best team in the group, certainly outside of us necessarily. So, you know, it's a big game. I would say for both teams, they need to avoid defeat. I mean, if there's a loser in this game, then obviously that team is going to have to get something off England. So yeah. that is going to make it a lot more challenging, I would say. So it's a big game. It's pro- we've got to, probably going to have to beat Iran if we want to go through where we've got. So, yeah, this, this that USA game is massive. It can't be underestimated, really, because whoever loses is playing catch-up straight away and will find it tough to qualify. So, yeah, it's all on that game uh, to start with, really, and then we'll we'll see where we go after that. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 Mitch, oh, the Welsh camp, because his, some of the bigger players are, are reaching the uh, twilight of their careers now. Um, Bale has obviously not played a great deal since uh, being out in, in LA, but he's um, he's cropped up with, he's a, he's a big player for big moments, isn't he? And he's done that throughout his uh, his, his, his career, um, whether it be at Real Madrid, Tottenham, Wales, and, and now even in LA as well. And he just comes off the bench and scores a last minute header. So he's one you can rely on um, to produce, even if he hasn't played in weeks before, especially if he's got the dragon on his chest. Other players as well. We talked about Joe Allen, whether he might be available, Aaron Ramsey and his game time. There's a lot of moving parts here, isn't there, from Rob Page to consider? Oh, 100%. And like like Steve was saying, that first game's enormous, but it just feels so similar to last year with the Euros where, you know, Switzerland, the really tough side, probably they were better than us on the day and probably should have won it, but we did well to get a draw out of that and it just kept us in the mix. And then the more favourable game in the middle, we went and won and it teed us up nicely for that last game and it helped that the Swiss got, um, you know, pumped in that second game, I think it would have been for them. So, you know, it gave us the chance to go to Italy and just be solid and defensive and a 1-0 defeat was enough in the end. And I feel like the fixtures are almost like dead, well, pretty much identical this time around mm. in terms of having the tough battle for second first up, then the 
in inverted commas, easier game in the middle, which won't be an easy game, by the way. Iran have got some really tidy attacking players and, you know, Carlos Queiroz is back there now. They adore him, so they'll be running through brick walls for him. Um, and then, obviously, the England game, which most of us, I don't know about you boys, but I'm absolutely dreading. I've got very little confidence going into that one. I never do. I don't know if it's just England or whatever it is, but it must be how Cardiff feel coming into the derby these days with Swans. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just one of those things, isn't it? So I, I think the fixtures are nice in the timing of them when we play who, um, but it's all on that USA game. You know, don't lose that, and we've got a great chance. Win it, and I think they're in dreamland Um you know, because you fans seem to get at the very least a draw against Iran, don't you? Yeah, it's it, it, it's that England being at the end, Steve. Um, it could well, be, very well, be in a case of uh, let's talk realistically. It could end up with a draw against the USA. We both then go on to beat Iran. Um, uh, we got to get uh, potentially something from the England game. Then just adds that extra level to what is already going to be a huge game. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a nightmare scenario where they could potentially knock us out, couldn't they? Which is terrible. At least that couldn't happen really at Euro 2016 with it being the middle game. But um, yeah, I mean, it's the ideal scenario is England win both of their games. If we're on four points going into that, then they may not go for it crazily because they'll know if they lose to us, then they would obviously become second. And from our point of view, we know a draw would put us through. So, you know, you'd almost hope then that they play out a terrible nil-nil. Um, but you know that's unlikely, isn't it? I think we, you know, I think as much as the England game matters, we've got to be focusing on the other games. Mm. And we'll take that one as it comes. That's the, you know, hopefully we won't need anything from that game. Um, but we'll see. I mean, from my point of view, I didn't really want to draw England because the whole point of drawing the World Cup is you want something different. Like I, I would love to have drawn Brazil or Argentina if I'm honest with you. Um, but we got England, and it is what it is, isn't it? But um. In terms of progressing, I don't think it's a terrible group at all. I do think we've we've got a reasonable chance. I mean, you look at some of the other ones where I think one of the groups we could have gone into at the end was Portugal and Uruguay <laughs> and someone else. And I was thinking that would be you know a big ask. Whereas I, I don't think this is the toughest group on paper. So we have got a chance of getting through if everybody's fit and most of them are playing well. And obviously, as that includes Gareth Bale, doesn't it, as, at the top of that list? It does. Um, you know, there's other players who are big players who I mentioned as well. Like, and Kiefer Moore uh, is, is just one of them who can often probably provide a foil um, up top to allow Gareth Bale to, to get into those spaces as well to, to create havoc. And Dan James's pace cannot be understated, even if his output sometimes um, isn't always there. And then you've got Brennan Johnson. So there's there's plenty of threats up there which can allow... Bail to then drift, and we've seen that um, as he gets older. You see, with these explosive players, sometimes they need to just give themselves a little bit of a breather and preserve energy for the massive moments. But let's talk about progression. Let's talk about best case scenario here, Mitch, in that our key players are fit, um, the ones we've discussed, the ones that potentially haven't had a great deal of game time. What what sort of picture can we can we say? Wales are looking at and say well we could target this from this tournament I think progressing from the group stage is definitely a realistic target I think finishing top would be incredible in that group I I, I don't see it myself but I said the same in 2016 and we all know what happened there but um, I just don't see that this time I think England are too strong and they're far better organised and better balanced than the Gareth Southgate um, but like I say second spot is firmly up for grabs and you know, if you can get through that the last 16 You'd like to think Netherlands would win Group A and it would probably mean facing them, which would be a hell of a tough ask. And, you know, I think that would probably be a, a success get out of the group. And if we lost to Netherlands in the last 16, that's probably a logical way of looking at it in terms of what's achievable. And, you know, they're a better side than us, let's be honest. As good as we were in the Nations League, conceding late goals, which were frustrating. We competed well with them, but, you know, they are a, a very top side at the moment in the Vanguard, aren't they? So, um but things don't work as as we planned, as we found out in 2016. So you just don't know, you know, could Senegal spring a surprise? I don't, I don't think Sadio Mane will be fit after all. That, that'd be a big blow for them. If so, Ecuador, you know, they could be decent, but you never know. And then Qatar, you, you fancy them to finish bottom of that group. So realistically, Netherlands would fancy themselves to top that one and, and ultimately play whoever's second, which would most likely be us or USA. So I can get out of the group and beyond that, anything's a bonus in my opinion. And Steve? 
Yeah, the same really. I mean, I think getting out of the group is is a realistic ask. Um, but we'll have to see who's fit, won't we? As, as a lot of it. I do also think as much as the Dutch would be favourites if we were to get through, and it, it is likely to be them, isn't it, if we were to finish second. It's not the hardest one for the last 16 either. We would not be the favourites, without a doubt. But, I mean, it's not like facing France or Brazil or anyone like that either. We did run them close in the summer. And if we're being honest, the, those games didn't feel very important because, obviously, we had the playoff game and we made changes for both of those games. So, and I almost think we would have a point to prove against them uh, because of, obviously, what did happen, where we conceded very late in both. So, I I think we'd have a, a little bit of a chance against them as as difficult as it would be. But, um, look, if we get out of the group, we'd be delighted. The pressure is then off. We can just have a go and, and see what happens, really, can't we? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the longer we stay there, the more interest is it uh, in for everyone who's travelling out to Qatar or surrounding countries. Steve, you're going out. Um, give us a little bit of a rundown on uh, your plan with Wales in the tournament, Wales potentially out of the tournament. How does your uh, next few weeks look? Uh, fly out on the weekend, um, staying in Dubai, flying in for all three games. Um, the hotel looks great, all inclusive. I found out earlier they put a massive TV screen um, outside. So that's by the pool area, I think. So free drinks while watching that sounds superb. Um, then flying in for all the games, as I say. I've got a voucher also for the last 16. So if we get that far. I do have the option of staying, but um, I will then be ruled out of the quarterfinal. I don't have the leave or the money to uh, <laughs> carry on. So, um, yeah, if we were to beat someone in the last 16, I would be delighted, but also pig sick that I had to go. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'm sure you'd find a way, Steve. I'm sure you'd find a way. Mitch, I'm sure they, they, they're holding you up in the, the biggest and best five-star hotels out in Qatar, and you're going to be working in luxury, I'm sure. Oh yeah, you don't know my employees, do you? Uh, <laughs> no, it's, we're staying in um, in a like FIFA based apartment, so it's not too far from the training ground where Wales are going to be based. It's only about three kilometres from there, so that's quite handy for us. And then it's about a, a half an hour bus or metro, wherever it'll be, to the um, to the stadium where we're playing all three group games. The Ahmad Bin Ali Stadium, so yeah, quite central. Like I say, I say central. Uh, I think. Qatar is only about the size of Yorkshire or something somebody said, so it should be fairly easy to get around. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm debating getting a quick flight to Dubai and crashing in Steve's place, to be honest. It sounds lovely. It does sound well, good. You're more than welcome to... Uh, <laughs> I don't think it'll be as fun as uh, shenanigans in Blackpool, unfortunately. Oh, what a weekend, mate. What a weekend. <laughs> Most of that stuff we can't even talk about on this podcast, but we'll leave that for now. <laughs> but um, no, that's that's it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mitch, for coming on this podcast. And I really, really enjoyed your input. Um, I really hope you both enjoy your trips and hope that means that Wales will do well as well, because uh, this will be the last tournament, you should imagine, for a couple of these players and a few of the players that have taken us through this incredible journey really do deserve the best send-off. So let's really hope that it goes out with a bang. Um, from this tournament going forward, Wales would look potentially very different anyway. So we're going to hope now for the best tournament possible, as we always would. Um, Steve, uh, I'm sure you're going to have a great time in Dubai and Mitch as well in Qatar working, I'm sure, but uh, pop over the border and see Steve at some point. Um, but from me and Steve and Mitch, thanks for listening and we'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.